Uh, the last and the eighth uh, speaker this today is also one who have traveled the longest distance all the way from Australia. Uh, please welcome Dr. Nadine Marshall from CSIRO. Uh, you work with commercial fishers, livestock producers, farmers to enhance their resilience to climate change and environmental degradation. Please welcome. You've had a benefit to, to listen o to all the other seven speakers. Uh, is it something particular that has made a, s a strong impression on you? Um, well, I, I've loved being here at such a high level meeting. I think one of the things that has been overwhelming to me is the, uh, the, uh, the interesting cross scales. Um, this morning we had a fantastic overview of the global situation, which has been really um, um, uh, 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 quite comprehensive, and it's really lovely to see how we've got. Um, I guess Eddie with industries and uh, and the national level and uh, Shandrika with communities and I think I'm going to give you the next perspective which is individuals which hopefully nests into all the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, hello everyone. It's really, really lovely to be here. I feel quite thrilled and, uh, and, and honoured, so thanks for that. Uh, but as I say, I've been wondering how mine fits in, but I think mine does fit in quite well. Certainly looking at a very individual um, um, scale not not for the individual's sake, although I do think individuals are certainly desperately in need of of strategies to uh, to cope with uh, with the challenges of climate change ahead. Um, but and, and they're also quite a, quite a neglected scale at, at, um, for very many reasons. But I think that um, that that any strategy we use will have to um, to to target lots uh, lots of the, uh, lots of scales: the global, the national, the uh, the regional, the in the industry scale, as well as the. Uh, the individuals and uh, so for today, uh, sorry, for today, I think I'm going to have to, yeah, here we go. <laughs> um, for today, um, I, I thought I would just concentrate on what can be done at a, at a local level, um, hoping that that will have implications um, up, up, the, uh, up the scale. And uh, thanks to Eddie, and I'm sure you've seen this before, um, IPCC have come up with a framework to help us um, um, understand the nature of vulnerability. Exposure, sensitivity, adaptive capacity is a really nice way that we can try and uh, practically understand the components to being vulnerable. And uh, because I work with um, really big multi-disciplinary um, teams in, um, in CSIRO in Australia, um, and with the help of the IUCN and Cordio and various other partners, we came up with this um, uh, uh, this this framework. We just we just developed the IPCC framework a little bit more to be absolutely clear what we're talking about when we're trying to measure the various components of vulnerability at a social ecological. Um, uh, system scale. So all we've really done is just, um, just, just clearly articulated that we want the ecological and the social systems to be separated out. Um, the biophysical scientists, whoops, sorry, the biophysical scientists concentrate on understanding the exposure of the of the uh, of the um, of the system, uh, the sensitivity of the fish. How how sensitive are they to warmer waters and uh, different currents and uh, I don't know. Um, um, different um, physical components, um, adaptive capacity in terms of, I don't know, biodiversity. But the, 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 uh, the square that I want to concentrate on is this one here, the social components. How do we understand human vulnerability to adaptation? And more importantly, how do we use this understanding to plan, to plan for the future? By understanding the nature of vulnerability, that the aim is here that we can develop some sensible plans and, uh, and, and strategies. Um, that, that are hopefully well targeted. But whatever the ecologists or the biophysical scientists come up with gives us a measure of the ecological vulnerability of the, uh, of the system in exactly the same way that we measure the ecological components of vulnerability. We're looking for social sensitivity. We're looking for um, the adaptive capacity of, of, um, of people. Now, um, the sensitivity of people is really a measure of how dependent are those people on that changing resource. And what I'd like to spend most of my time now doing is describing how can we measure this component and this component in a way that gives us some sort of really strong practical advice to developing these climate adaptation plans. Does that work? So the first thing is resource dependency. So how sensitive you are to climate change really depends on how um, dependent you are on those resources that are climate sensitive. Um, and obviously everybody in the world is economically dependent um, in, in, in um, 
in, in, in a very strong way. But it's not just an economic dependency, and this is what I'd really like to, to emphasise. People can be, and probably even more so, socially dependent on what they do. And um, this, because it's sometimes quite difficult to measure, it often gets overlooked. But I really can't emphasise how important it is in understanding barriers to change, to barriers to transformation, to adaptation. Um, often when we work with fishing industries, we find them extraordinarily resistant or stubborn to, um, to adopting these new strategies that we keep on um, pushing on them. And I think a lot of it can be described in terms of the, the, the dependency that these people have, in social terms especially, um, on, on, um, on natural resources. And just very, very quickly, I'd like to, to, um, to go through this list. To me, I came to the social sciences quite late. And uh, um, to me, the attachment to occupation was one of those factors that really emphasised to me how important um, dependency is from a social point of view. Attachment to occupation is about identity. Um, it, it's, um, you know, for example, it's, you know, I am a fisherman, that's what I am. Um, I, I can't be anything else, I, I couldn't be anything else, I, I am a fisherman. Um, so from that you can understand how flexible these people are in thinking of options for their future um, and, um, um, and the sorts of options that are going to be feasible or acceptable or desirable to them. Um, in the same way, um, employability is, a, is an important and easy thing to measure. It's not only in terms of age and uh, level of transferable skill sets, it's also in attitudes to working elsewhere. For example, in some of the really remote commercial uh, um, fishing um, areas in Australia. Um, you know, uh, we have fishermen who have, who have been asked to, um, to no longer fish here, it's unviable, it's unsustainable, could you go and do something else, maybe charter tourism. Um, and I, and I, I had a fisherman who said to me, look, I've just never, ever worn shoes in my life. I'm not even wearing thongs for a tourist. <laughs> um, so those sorts of attitudes really, I think, hit home um, how the social dependency uh, means that whatever change does happen you know, from a resource point of view, they are going to be very sensitive to them, not because of their economic dependency, but because of their social dependency. Um, and in the same way, place attachments are really important. Um, climate change is... is um, um, it requires people to move their homes, um, and in the short term, it's the regulators who are who are asking people to uh, uh, to to move elsewhere um, because of place attachment. It's, um, it makes it makes this change very very difficult, and can really can really describe how people can be dependent on what they do, and uh, how sensitive they're going to be to uh, to changes, or in this case, regulatory changes as well. Um, I won't go through each one of them um, too carefully. Family characteristics can obviously make you dependent on what you do, sensitive to changes. Uh, networks are really important. We found that, um, that both formal and informal networks are really important. People who tend to uh, talk to their colleagues as well as to government um, tend to be less dependent on what they do. They tend to have a much more flexible approach or um, um, have many more options available to, that, to them um, in, in um, designing their own future. Business approach is really important. Um, some people are very strategic in the way they run their fishing enterprise, for example, um, and, and uh, unfortunately many people aren't. But um, that certainly can, can discriminate quite quickly between those people who are more dependent on, what they, on, 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 a, on a climate sensitive resource and, uh, and those that aren't. Uh, business characteristics. Obviously, we're all um, dependent um, on, on what we do, and fishers are economically dependent on, um, uh, on the resource as well. Um, local knowledge is an interesting one. Um, in one, in one um, aspect, it's, um, it's a positive. It really helps adaptation because fishers who have been fishing in a patch for a long time, for example, are, are um, continually getting feedbacks from their environment. They're understanding the changes that are going on. And this can make them much more amenable to, um, to change or to having to change their own practices. But at the same time, it makes them very dependent on what they do. Um, the idea of having to move elsewhere because of regulatory change or climate changes uh, may well mean that, um, that that investment that they've made in themselves is, is going to be really, really hard to replicate elsewhere and that can make them very sensitive or very dependent um, on their local patch. And environmental awareness is one of those other um, interesting things that we found, that people, that people, regardless of what country or culture, people who seem to be aware of the um, environmental impact they're having, their industry is having, um, and, and also what social norms are happening globally um, and locally tend to be much more open to, uh, to, to change and much more flexible in the way they think um, and in the way they want to design, um, I guess, their own future. 
So that's, that's the first box, climate sensitivity. So climate sensitivity um, with exposure gives us some idea of what the potential impacts are of climate change. It gives us the climate risk. So at that, 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 at that very early um, stage, we can understand what the impacts would be, the social impacts would be of some sort of change. Um, um, and it can be political change, cultural change, or um, um, and environmental degradation or um, regulatory change. Um, <laughs> But people being people, we can moderate those impacts um, that, that um, climate change can have by the level of adaptive capacity we have. And adaptive capacity is one of those um, really, really, you know, sort of obscure concepts, but we sort of <laughs> tried to have, uh, to have a go at it. And what we did was um, really intensively interviewed um, 100 commercial fishers, in, in actually in various countries, um, um, and, and ask them a set of about 75 statements to do with change, very, very various sorts of change, um, how, and we want to know how they would respond to them. And we gave them the statements, we asked them to respond on a four-point Likert scale for those who were registered. And, and uh, the statements were both um, short-term and long-term um, statements, so we really want to try and get an idea of um, the adaptive capacity both in the, in the, um, the longer-term and the shorter-term. And for those who are interested, we, we put those results in a very simple analysis to try and condense um, the dimensions of change to try and understand what a typical response to change is. And what we found is that there are four very, um, um, very typical responses to, um, to change regardless of the nature of the change event itself. And there were these four um, dimensions here. The first one is how people manage, and, um, and manage uncertainty and, and relate to risk. This is a very, very strong differentiator between those who have a high adaptive capacity and those that, that don't. Um, very, very few people see opportunity in risk, um, see opportunity in uncertainty. Most of us tend to be quite conservative. It's a natural tendency of us, and uh, and it certainly makes a, makes for a very um, s clear delineation between um, um, I in the way we, we approach the future. The second most dimension we found was the the skill sets, the the ability to plan, to learn, to reorganise. Um, an extraordinarily small amount of individuals have these skills, and this is really a, a quite an obvious um, discriminator again about who's got who's got the higher adaptive capacity and where our weaknesses uh, really are. Thirdly, we found flexibility is obviously quite important, and flexibility is not only financial flexibility, um, change costs. Um, uh, costs money, uh, those people with a higher financial buffer are much more likely to absorb the costs of change. But it's also emotional flexibility. This is the, the human um, nature coming out in adaptive capacity. Some of us are lucky enough to run, to, to sort of sell through life. Some of us um, have traumas, and regardless of how resilient you are in other, in other aspects of your life, this human component uh, can sort of really have an impact in that when it comes out statistically at least. Um, and finally, the fourth one is an interest in change. We've done this over several studies, actually, and uh, we're actually finding that, um, well, just sort of very, very roughly, for about 40% of people are really interested to know what the future might look like, what they might need for it. Um, but the majority of us <laughs> really live very, very much in the here and now. Um, and, and that certainly does come out when you do these sorts of analyses to, to, to try and understand who may well have that higher adaptive capacity than whom. So at this very early age, we, stage, um, we can look at what the vulnerability of, a, of an industry might be or a region might be, or we can compare industries or regions or whatever, or, or certainly just at an individual level. But it gives us some idea of, um, of, of how people are vulnerable at that, at that very basic level and whether or not we can translate or extrapolate this up, um, upscales to communities or industries or whatever. We're, we're sort of certainly in those, exp um, those initial stages at the moment. And vulnerability, or well measuring vulnerability doesn't have to be a big thing. Ideally, we get social scientists in, we do very extensive social surveys. Um, but it can also be um, uh, um, you know, making the most of expert knowledge, doing literature reviews if the information's there, or even doing rapid assessments where we need. But I think at this very early stage in, our, in developing our knowledge of what it takes to develop plans for the future and move forward, um, it, it's, a, it's a very good starting point to understand the nature of, uh, of um, vulnerability. And I think the other advantage of this approach is it, it helps, um, I guess, investors in conservation or adaptation planning to understand um, who will benefit most from the assistance that, that we might be able to put uh, into a region. So when we're trying to, to, um, to develop plans to, to move forward, um, 
I think we're limited by our creativity in, in coming up with, um, with strategies. Um, but it certainly does make it easier when you, when you do studies such as this that looks at, um, at the level of correlation between, for example, adaptive capacity, and I've got the four up the top here, and, uh, and a whole list of factors describing resource dependency or climate sensitivity. Um, very many dimensions of adaptive capacity are highly correlated with, um, uh, with resource dependency. The stars indicate significant uh, relationships there and red ones are inverse relationships. So for example, um, if you have a really high identity as being, for example, a fisher, you probably don't have very good um, um, planning skills and you probably don't perceive risk or uncertainty very positively either. Uh, if you have a strong attachment to place, you probably definitely don't have um, um, either. <laughs> um, you know, you, you're probably quite low on all adaptive capacity components um, and the list goes on. But managing for identity, we can't really go into, into um, developing countries, into communities and, uh, and ask people to change their identity. It's an extraordinarily difficult thing to do. Some of the more feasible things to do are to, to concentrate on more manageable aspects of resource dependency such as um, people's business approach um, by doing very simple things like getting people to learn about um, strategy um, is, a, is, is um, yeah, well hopefully a very useful thing to do but it also has very um, 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 a very strong relationship with how people perceive risk with how they plan and, uh, and the level of interest they have in their own future. We also see this with networks, both formally and informally, that encourages um, a more positive perception of risk and it encourages uh, stronger planning. So using, at, at this very, very early stage, how do we use this information to develop adap adaptation plans at, w at whatever scale? Um, and so I've just given you that whole list of um, factors describing resource dependency. But we could do the same for adaptive capacity. So there were four dimensions that I talked to you about, uh, or I introduced to you about adaptive capacity. And ideally we want to turn those, um, those factors into, into actions. So how can we get people to manage uncertainty that little bit more confidently? How do we get people to develop their planning skills? How can we increase their flexibility, probably not emotionally, but certainly financially? And how do we get people to create um, some sort of interest in their own future? Well, we've, we've um, st um, started to explore a few um, strategies. Um, some are better developed than others. But certainly to manage uncertainty, for example, and obviously this list is, um, uh, you know, it really needs some sort of um, workshopping and brainstorming with, with um, people, uh, with all of you, really. But um, so for managing uncertainty, um, certainly that's, that's a lot about identifying and supporting people to, to consider di a diverse but also um, acceptable uh, livelihoods. And I mean acceptable in terms of if you have an identity that's fishing, don't go and put them into a beekeeping business, for example. <laughs> Um, and, so, and also supporting individuals to take um, uh, risky strategies. So if we're talking about developing planning skills, um, I think one of the, one of the, the most urgent needs that, that, that um, investments, I investors can, can start to think about uh, is developing curricula that, that um, takes us away from learning mathematics and whatever we need to, um, to do formally, but to try and develop life skills. How do we plan for the future? How do we develop strategi strategic um, skill sets? Um, we certainly don't, um, don't even dis don't discuss this as yet in Australia. We st we've just now got a group of fishers who have accepted to, <laughs> um, to experiment with developing workshops and see on er how on earth that goes. But um, um, I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done in how we try to... Um, to develop our own skill sets, probably in a range of um, at a range of scales, um, we certainly need to encourage experimentation. But experimentation is really expensive. That's certainly something that can be supported in the short term, and we certainly need to encourage learning by facilitating networks. And I think this is an interesting one um, for the fishing industry. I won't go into now, but there's certainly a very strong role for women in these sorts of activities. Increasing flexibility is really um, uh, quite an obvious one pro by providing financial incentives to experiment with options and also developing partnerships to, um, to share the costs of change. So these are two that we're sort of uh, really, really experimenting with in Australia um, and it'll be interesting to see how, how, um, wh what sort of result we get there. And certainly creating um, interest in the future is a really important one and potential uh, strategies there are rewarding early adopters, monitoring environmental changes and communicating them to, uh, to everyone, getting people involved in understanding the problem in the first place 
um, and encouraging community dialogue about ways to, uh, to adapt. So in summary, um, what we're seeing, I think, what we, uh, I think the opportunity, there is huge opportunity here. Climate change um, creates opportunity for sustainability. It's for the first time, I think, instead of going to fishers and saying, look, you're not being sustainable here, we're going to have to work together to come up with um, good strategies, it just doesn't work. Um, I think climate change makes it much easier for us to say, let's work together to, to develop plans against that enemy climate change. And it seems to be a much more, um, to me, a, a much more positive way forward into developing, um, I, I guess, sustainability goals uh, generally. Um, but I think this sort of approach really um, provides opportunities in the, uh, in the short term at least to identify how people are vulnerable to climate change at the individual scale at, at, at least. Um, and, uh, and it helps us to identify who needs most assistance and, uh, um, and who will benefit the most. And, uh, and that's it. Thanks to <laughs> very many people. Thank you. Now you can hear me. Thank you very much, Nadine. Uh, anyone got a question for Nadine? Otherwise, I have one. Uh, you very, very briefly mentioned uh, that the women could have an in important role in these issues. Could you just uh, explore it a bit? Um, uh, sorry, I'll just turn this off. Yeah, it's on. Oh, it's on. Yeah, um, yeah I think, I think um, the, the women aspect in climate change is really quite interesting. We focus a lot on women being victims in climate change, and obviously that's a, an extraordinary um, concern. But I think women have an, a, a potentially have um, a huge... Um, I guess responsibility here in, in taking a lot of control in, in how the future looks. Um, for example, in the commercial fishing industry, a lot of fishers are attracted to the industry because of their... Um, actually, I'm, this is, um, I'm speaking from an Australian focus here. <laughs> uh, but certainly in Australia, um, people can go out fishing for extraordinary months um, per year and they're very, very good at fishing. Um, but it's a very isolated, very extreme environment. But these people are attracted to that environment because of their personality. Um, so that's their strength. Uh, their personality is their strength. Um, but in so many ways, that personality is a, is a, is a weakness because it means, from, from, the results that from the results that we're finding, it's the people that are networked that seem to have much higher adaptive capacity. People who, who share their learnings. You know, I tried fishing over here or I tried this strategy, didn't work, don't try that. Um, but it's those ones who have a much higher adaptive capacity. But for the most part, commercial fishers don't like to network um, about those sorts of issues at least. And... Uh, um, and that's a, ma a massive concern um, for us. So we're trying to experiment at the moment, saying, well, how do we get these commercial fishers to talk to each other? What do we do? How do we connect them with society? Um, and one, one of the strategies we're looking at at the moment is looking at the role of women. Um, a lot of them are married, and uh, their women are, are certainly very well connected to society through schools, boards, or, um, um, it, um, jobs in, in, in normal society, and perhaps they have a much better connection. Mm. Um, Actually, there's another one as well. We, uh, I have a, a PhD. Have, can I, have I got a moment? Uh, sure. <laughs> um, I have a PhD student, Ellie Lancaster, who's looking at the role of um, identity and conservation and uh, working with graziers, but very similar industries. Um, she's finding that when you talk to the graziers, to the men, uh, they can certainly um, rattle off you know, up to 10 identities. Um, but on average, men will have, th or these, these resource dependent men will have um, two or three identities. You know, I am a fisher, or I'm a cattle grazier, or whatever I am, and I. I'm a dad or a husband, whatever. But on average, it's two or three. Um, whereas the women will have um, probably about ten um, in a range, quite different ones, but on average, they'll have four or five. Um, but because our suicide rate is so high in Australia, in fact, it's one every three days, a, 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 you know, a, someone, um, a farmer will shoot himself. Uh, we're wondering whether, um, but women don't seem to do that so much, and we're wondering whether during the really, um, the, the really uh, crisis periods, um, because identity is so strong, um, it, it, men don't have anything to switch to, so it's that, it's that traumatic, whereas women may well be able to help out um, a little bit more actively by, by getting this sort of information. We're hoping that they may well take, take, um, uh, uh, use that understanding in, in helping switch <laughs> um, in some way from a family point of view. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> it's a long-winded way of saying it. But, um, yeah. Interesting perspective. Thank you very, very much. Oh, thank you.